Professor Anthony Pym is a, a longtime friend of the, the NIDA School and the NIDA Institute. Uh, he has been an ally and a conversation partner, I think, as we have been trying to navigate uh, our own work in <coughs> translation studies to define what we're doing. And I'm delighted to introduce him. He is Professor of Translation and Intercultural Studies and Coordinator of the Intercultural Studies Group at Rovira y Virgili University in Tarragona, Spain. He runs a doctoral program in Translation and Intercultural Studies. He's also president of the European Society for Translation Studies, a fellow of the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies, and visiting researcher at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. He's the author of, and here I'll pick a few of the books that I know best and have uh, been instructive for me, uh, most recently, Exploration, Exploring uh, Translation uh, Theories, the Moving Text, 2004, Negotiating the Frontier in 2000, and Method in Translation History, 1998. And I, I can't uh, avoid mentioning, or I won't, uh, the English translation of his French book on ethics, which is hopefully forthcoming, uh, with the title On Translator Ethics. Please join me in welcoming Professor Anthony Pym. It's very appropriate here to pay homage to Eugene Nida, uh, who did so much to open the intellectual space within which we work in translation studies uh, in Europe, in the United States, and in the, all, all the communities that are involved in here. Uh, as I've had occasion to point out in, in other talks and, and papers, uh, for me, the, the main contribution of Eugene Nida wasn't particularly as the founder or father or promoter of dynamic equivalence. It was to open this space in which there was one polarity, one kind of work that translators could do for a particular kind of translation for particular kinds of communities. But there was also always uh, formal uh, correspondence, previously formal equivalence, traveling with it. Uh, Nida's, Nida's intellectual work for me was not just as a, as a linguist, as a scholar of Greek, uh, as a promoter, a tireless promoter of, of, of his ideas, as a brilliant writer, as somebody who could write about translation with a multitude of examples and illustrations from numerous cultures, numerous languages. It was the fact that he opened a space for discussion and debate and exploration that didn't exist prior to him, I think. Prior to NIDA, we have more or less opinions and uh, people with a lot of certitude that what they're doing is the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, with NIDA, we have, well, since NIDA, we've had a far wider space for debate and exchange. And I'm personally very, very appreciative of that. I became particularly appreciative uh, of NIDA's work when I realized the impact it's had not just what, you know, in evangelical circles and those kinds of missionary activities that he was involved in, but um, in the translation policies of the Vatican, of the Catholic Church, which is a topic that has been of interest to me um, in recent times. And, and I was so surprised, to tell you the truth, to get back to the early very clear translation policy, 1969, known as Comme le Prévois, uh, and to find that the basic points that Eugene Nider is certainly not mentioned, equivalence is not mentioned, dynamic equivalence is not mentioned, but the points raised there are pure Eugene Nider dynamic equivalence. And this was a tremendous surprise to me, the fact that a bit of activism is fine, and uh, with Spanish, even better for, for me because I work in Spain and on that particular language. But to have that tremendous influence on the fundamental policy of the big church uh, is quite something. I, I read from the Comte de Prévois. It's not sufficient that a liturgical translation merely reproduce the expressions and ideas of the original text. 
Okay? Rather, it must faithfully communicate to a given people and their own language that which the church, by means of this given text, originally intended to communicate. There you have the dynamic equivalent idealism. A faithful translation, therefore, cannot be judged on the basis of individual words. The total context of this specific act of communication must be kept in mind, as well as the literary form proper to the respective language, where the respective language is the target language, and the rights and priorities of that language, and by extension culture, enter into the fray as a dominating force. This seems to me very radical to read even now, uh, coming from the Vatican. Further, to discover the true meaning of a text, the translator must follow the scientific methods of textual study as used by experts. And the experts, uh, not necessarily theologians, not necessarily believers. They can be linguists and uh, anthropologists and people who know about cultures and who know about communication. And that role of science and expertise from beyond the church is open there uh, and was closed rather quickly, as we'll see. Further, it's allowed in Comme le Prévois that uh, the translations should be established by mixed commissions. That is, people from the church who know the text and people from the target culture, as we would call it with NIDA, who are involved uh, in expressing and putting forward their own preferences and priorities. Authorization would then be by the established church, but those mixed commissions were uh, a, a, an important and radical um, institution put forward in the wake of NIDA and expressed by the Vatican in 1969. 